The following presentation is from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland. Thank you, Ed McClellan. <laughs> Thank Melissa for pinch hitting this morning as uh, Mary Ann's in the hospital, and so uh, keep Ed and Mary Ann McClellan in your prayers. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful together in your house. We're thankful to worship you and to bless your holy name. It is the name that is above every name, and we thank you that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those in earth and those under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to wait until that day to proclaim your Lordship, but that we can do it even now. And as we study your word, I ask that you would help us to show how we may apply it to our lives and truly live as those who follow you as Lord and Savior. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, forgiveness lies at the heart of Christian faith. When Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he instructed them with these words, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. As Jesus hangs upon the cross, we hear him pray, Father, forgive them. In his first resurrection appearance to his disciples, Jesus declares, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. In the Apostles' Creed, the church teaches us to confess that I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Whether we look to the Lord's Prayer or to the cross, to Jesus' resurrection, or to the great creeds of the church, we are never far away from the theme of forgiveness. Whatever else might be said about Christians, it must be said that we are a people who believe in forgiveness, that we believe in the forgiveness of sins. Now, most of us enter the Christian faith at least somewhat motivated, if not primarily motivated, to find forgiveness for our sins. As we grow in the Christian faith, we become aware that we're called to extend forgiveness to others. And so we enter the Christian faith to find forgiveness and as we continue to grow in the faith, we are to become forgiving people. And I would submit that to be an authentic follower of Christ, we must embrace the centrality of forgiveness. Now, most of us don't question this part of it. Most of us don't question the centrality of forgiveness. We believe that forgiveness is a good thing, that forgiveness is an important thing to our Christian faith. What we question is not forgiveness in general. What we question is the extent of forgiveness. To what extent are we expected to forgive? How far should we go in forgiving? How much should be forgiven? How often should we forgive? And this seemed to be the question in Peter's mind. That's the question as he comes to Jesus. and He says, how many times must I forgive my brother who sins against me? And before Jesus has an opportunity to respond, Peter puts forth his own idea, his own idea regarding the extent of forgiveness. As many as seven times? Wow, I'm sure that Peter was feeling quite proud of himself, quite generous. He was pleased by his substantial and plentiful offer of forgiveness. Forgiveness times seven. Wow, good job, Peter. Who? Seven. Seven is the divine number, so surely forgiven seven times must be considered a divine act. Surely no one would be expected to go beyond forgiving an offense seven times. But can you imagine Peter's astonishment when Jesus proclaimed, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Seventy times seven. Now, I didn't have Carol Slegel for math, and she's not here to harass about that today. But I think that comes up to 490 times. 490 times. Now in your Bibles, there's sometimes an uncertainty among translators as to whether Jesus meant 77 or 77s. Did Jesus mean 70 plus 7 or 70 times 7? Well, the Greek text is ambiguous. It can go either way. So some translate it 77, and many other translations have 70 times 7. I tend to hold to a translation of 70 times 7. But no matter how you slice it, it's a heck of a lot of times to forgive the same person, isn't it? When Peter suggests sevenfold forgiveness, he goes well beyond what most are willing to do. Forgive the same person for the same offense seven times. Who would dare ask any more of us? Well, 
Unfortunately, Jesus does. In fact, Jesus' answer says that if you're still counting how many times you've forgiven someone, you're missing the point. Don't even think about counting, Jesus is saying in essence. Just do it. Just forgive. Make no mistake about it. Make no mistake, this call to forgiveness is extreme. It's a call that transcends the bounds of what can be considered reasonable. To follow Jesus as a disciple is to become a practitioner of radical forgiveness, of unreasonable forgiveness, of seemingly impossible forgiveness. To make his point clear, Jesus tells Peter a little story, a little parable. We've been studying the parables of Jesus in recent weeks. And don't you just love this parable? I mean, if ever there was someone who got what they deserved, it's this weasel, right? It's this guy. This parable concerns a servant, the weasel, who owed his master the absurd amount of 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents, an amount equivalent to 10,000 years of wages. A debt so enormous it would take like 200 lifetimes to repay. And this weasel was about to be sold into slavery when he fell to his knees and he begged for patience and more time. And in response, the master miraculously forgave his servant entire debt. The entire debt is wiped away. Imagine that kind of debt being forgiven. Wouldn't you be a little relieved? Perhaps a little overjoyed? Maybe, just maybe, you'd want to pass a little bit of that forgiving spirit on. But not our little weasel. Not our little weasel. Instead of being transformed into a generous and forgiving person through his encounter with extravagant mercy, the weasel went out and found a fellow servant who owed him 100 denarii. 100 denarii was about 100 days' wages. It was a significant amount, but nothing in comparison to the bazillion dollars the weasel had been forgiven. And yet, he goes and he takes his debtor by the throat and he demands immediate payment. When his fellow servant was unable to pay, the weasel had him thrown into prison. How could he not overlook a relatively minor debt when he had just been forgiven an impossibly huge one? When the master heard of his atrocious behavior, he summoned the weasel. He called him wicked, and he said, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? The master then had the ungrateful servant turned over to his mafia enforcer, and the torture began until he re repaid all his debt, which was, of course, never. Isn't it delicious? Isn't it just great, right? The weeping, the gnashing, the justice, we just love it when a guy gets what he deserves. But then, then Jesus closes the parable with these words. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from the heart. Oh, crud. The weasel. The weasel is me. I've been shown so much mercy. So much mercy. More mercy, in fact, than I could even describe. More mercy than I could ever deserve. And why can't I have mercy on this huge weasel? And that's what this passage is about. Mercy, extravagant, ridiculous, over-the-top mercy. Mercy not just on the undeserving, but especially on the undeserving. In matters of injustice, we tend to fall into the trap of a false dichotomy. We tend to think that there are only two options, payment or punishment. Perpetrators of injustice must, must be made to pay, and if they can't pay, then they must be punished. This was the false dichotomy of the servant in Jesus' parable. When a fellow servant was discovered in his debt, he first demanded payment, and when payment was not possible, he insisted upon punishment. And yet, this wicked weasel should have known that there was another option. There was another option, the option of pardon. And he should have known of the pardon option because he had been a recipient of extravagant forgiveness. To be the recipient of God's extravagant forgiveness places an obligation upon the recipient to become the kind of person who embraces this third option. This third option, which is neither payment nor punishment, but the option of pardon. This is not a cheap pardon. This is not a cheap pardon. There is real loss. In Jesus' parable, the master was willing to lose the unimaginable amount of 10,000 talents in order to pardon and keep the servant a free man. 
The master, in effect, said, I will suffer the loss in order that you can remain a free man in the human community. The master's loss was substantial. It was enormous. The master is not repaid. He absorbs the loss. It's only through absorbing the pain of his loss that he is able to offer pardon to the debtor. Indeed, the forgiveness of wrongs is never cheap, but always painful because someone must bear the loss. But when the pardoned servant imprisoned his fellow servant because he was unable to pay, he exited the world of grace and he re-entered the world of retribution, a world where every penny has to be accounted for and every debtor must be paid or punished. In lust for his payback, the servant has broken the law of reciprocal grace that Jesus set forth in the Lord's Prayer when he said, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. In reverting to the dichotomy of payback or punishment, the unforgiving servant had cast himself back into the torturous world of recycled revenge. In an essay entitled The Pain of Forgiveness, Rachel Tulick dispels this false dichotomy. She writes these words. She says, justice can never be achieved by reparation or retribution alone, because like the servant's debts, true wrongs can never be repaid. The hurt and pain caused are not reversible. Punishing the guilty person does not undo the hurt either, even if it brings brief satisfaction to the victim, just as the first servant did not get his money back simply because the other man was in jail. Justice must be about much more than balancing out the wrongs of the world. It must be about making things right, about the kind of restoration that does not reverse the pain, but moves beyond it towards something new. Tulik continues, and just as wrongs cannot be erased by punishment or repayment, they cannot really be erased by simple forgiveness either. When the master forgives the servant's debt, the debt does not simply disappear, the master takes the loss. He accepts the full brunt of the debt himself. Similarly, when a person forgives, he or she accepts the full brunt of the heart of the hurt or injustice rather than returning it on the one who caused it. Although it is painful, this is the way that healing and restoration begin. This vision of forgiveness is not a magical way of balancing the scales, but it is a way to move beyond the scorekeeping of the scales towards something completely new. If we really want to live in God's new world, we must be willing to suffer the pain of costly forgiveness, for only then can we experience the world where all things are being made new. There's nothing older. There's nothing older than the cycle of revenge. There's nothing older than the keeping and settling of scores. But it takes Holy Spirit-inspired eyes to fully appreciate that the world where you make your debtors pay their debts is the world where you will be made to pay your debts. What the world needs, if it is to move beyond the endless cycle of revenge, is the practice of reciprocal and costly forgiveness. Now, I've wrestled with this parable many times in the past, but this week as I studied, a new insight began to emerge. And in the end, this was very helpful to me. In the end, what this parable is about is imitating Christ. This parable is really about imitating Christ. Ultimately, the failure of the unforgiving servant was the failure to imitate his master. The servant received grace from the hand of his master, but he failed to emulate his master in dispensing grace. To be a member of the kingdom means that we bask in the unbelievable forgiveness, acceptance, and grace that we have experienced from Jesus Christ, and we try as much as we can to live out of that to be a member of the kingdom of God means that we imitate Jesus. To be a Christian means that we imitate Christ. I'm getting hot up here. Good thing there's not others over here. The first century expectation was, was that the Messiah would be a writer of wrongs, one who would issue paybacks, take up the sword, and prevail in battle against Israel's Gentile oppressors. But Jesus didn't follow the plan. Jesus didn't come as an avenging Messiah. He didn't come to issue paybacks. He didn't come to take up the sword against Israel's enemies. Instead of a stirring war speech, Jesus brought a revolutionary message of loving and forgiving one's enemies. 
Instead of bringing the hammer down on Israel's enemies, Jesus laid down his own life as a lamb to be slaughtered. Instead of perpetuating the cycle of revenge with a sword, Jesus ended the cycle of revenge with his cross. Instead of demanding that we pay what we cannot or punishing us for paying when we cannot, the God that we see in Jesus Christ accepts the losses himself and opens up his arms even to those who would murder him. Instead of calling out for vengeance, Jesus prayed for his executioners, Father, forgive them. And on that cross, as Jesus absorbed the blow and as Jesus forgave his enemies, Jesus was saving the world. And if we are to follow this master, then we must follow the path that Jesus established. Like Jesus, we confront this world bent on paybacks and vengeance. Like Jesus, we opt out of the game of getting even and we give up the need for revenge. And when we choose... When we choose to forgive those who intentionally and maybe even maliciously harm us instead of continuing the cycle of revenge, we become a living imitation of Jesus Christ. We become a living imitation of Jesus Christ. And that is what we are called to be. On May 31st, 1981, Muhammad Ali Akka, a Turkish Muslim, approached John Paul II as he traveled through St. Peter's Square. From a few feet away, Ali Akka fired a gun, and four bullets struck the Pope's torso, right arm, and left hand. Ali Akka was immediately apprehended, and the gravely injured Pope was rushed to the hospital. John Paul II would spend 22 days in the hospital, recovering from Ali Akka's attack. In his first statement following the attempted assassination, the Pope requested that people pray for my brother Ali Akka, whom I have sincerely forgiven. Two years later, Pope John Paul II visited Ali Akka in prison. In a private room, the two men sat knee to knee, face to face, the Pope holding the hand of his would-be assassin and forgiving him. There are two iconic uh, uh, photographs, not autographs, photographs. There are two iconic photographs that emerged from these two dramatic encounters of Pope John Paul and Ali Akka. The first is a photo of the shocked Pope the shocked face of Pope John Paul II, his papal robe splattered with blood just after being shot. And the second is a photo of the shocked face of Ali Akka as the Pope met with him in prison and forgave him. Two iconic images, two iconic faces. One registering the shock of being the victim of unexpected and undeserved violence. The second registering the shock of being the recipient of unexpected and undeserved violence forgiveness. The second picture, the one of John Paul II forgiving a visibly shaken Ali Akba was on the cover of the January 9th, 1984 issue of Time Magazine with the caption, why forgive? Why forgive? Why indeed? The Pope's whispered words of pardon to his would-be assassin were a clarion shout to the world that this is what Jesus looks like. This is what Christianity is. This is what it means to imitate and to follow Jesus. Over the next 20 years, the Pope not only befriended Ali Akba, but his family as well. And when Ali Akba was released from prison in 2006, he held up a copy of the famous Time magazine and called the man that he tried to murder his friend. The Pope's forgiveness of Ali Akba is a contemporary example of a Christian imitating Christ. Jesus prayed for his tormentors to be forgiven when he could have called upon angels of vengeance. And Pope John Paul II offered pardon as he held the hand of the man who had fired a gun at his heart. Now you might be inclined to say, you know, he's the Pope. That's what popes are supposed to do. We just can casually dismiss this. Well, I would say that might be true, but until quite recently, that's not how a pope would be expected to respond to an attempted murder by a Muslim fanatic. Such an attempted murder probably in the past would have, re would have resulted in, in a response of violence. Violence would have won. Vengeance would have won. Satan would have won. But Pope John Paul II did not respond to violence with violence, to vengeance with vengeance, uh, to satanic ways with satanic ways. Instead, the Pope imitated Christ, took the blow, loved his enemy, forgave his assailant, overcame evil with good, and turned the ugliness of hate into the beauty of Christ-like forgiveness. In hatred, Ali Akbar fired bullets of hate into the body of John Paul II. And though the bullets almost took the Pope's life, the hate never touched his soul. 
John Paul II responded with whispered words of love and forgiveness, and those words caused multitudes around the world to ponder the possibilities of forgiveness. And I believe that that is the call for us this morning, to ponder the possibilities of forgiveness. So here's the question for you. Here's the question for you. Who is your Ali Akba? Who has fired the gun of hate at your heart? Hopefully you've not been shot with real bullets, but who hasn't been shot in the heart with hateful words? Who hasn't been shot in the heart with hateful deeds? Words and deeds that have the potential to poison your mind and ruin your soul. The question becomes, will you escalate the violence and perpetuate the cycle of revenge, either in action or attitude? Or will you absorb the blow, forgive the perpetrator, and end the cycle of revenge? It's not easy, is it? It is not easy. In fact, it might be the most difficult thing that we are called to do in following Christ. But it also may be it just may be the most accurate way that we imitate Christ and become genu genuinely Christ-like. And so again I ask, who is your Ali Akba? Who is the person who has fired the gun of hateful words or worse at your heart? Will you imitate Christ? Will you go to your Ali Akba and whisper words of pardon? The practice of radical and unconditional forgiveness, of forgiving 70 times 7, of taking the ugliness of hate and turning it into the beauty of forgiveness, this is the kingdom of God. This is what it means to be Christ-like. And if we can take up our crosses and follow Jesus in this practice, even our enemies will be found confessing. Truly, truly these people are the sons and daughters of God. May it be so in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this message today. First of all, we thank you for the overwhelming, the overwhelming grace and mercy that you have poured into our lives. You pour that mercy out unto our lives while we were yet sinners. You died for us. And you gave your all so that we might have life with you. And Lord, we are just in awe of that grace and that mercy and how much you have forgiven us and you continue to forgive us on a daily basis. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, you call us as recipients of grace and mercy to then become those who share that grace and that mercy and that forgiveness with others. But so often, Lord, we can't do it. So often we struggle. We continue to perpetuate the cycle of revenge. You're calling us today to imitate Jesus, to become like Him, to absorb the loss, to take the blow, and to extend pardon and forgiveness. Rather than payment or punishment, help us, God, to choose this option of pardon. Lord, we thank You that You are bringing a new world and that we can begin to reflect that new world today, even in the way in which we live, by it being the forgiving and the loving people that you have called us to be. Truly, O oh Lord, we ask that you would forgive us our debts, even as we extend your forgiveness to those who have debts uh, that we hold, Lord. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. The preceding presentation came from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland.